Since the 1950s, Seventh-day Adventists have become some of the most highly studied populations in the world. More than 140 scientific papers have been published using tens of thousands of Seventh-day Adventists as subjects. How is it? 120 over 80, right on the mark. And the singular cause of all this attention, it's the discovery that the Seventh-day Adventist lifestyle leads to increases in life expectancy of six to eight years and a dramatic reduction in premature death rates from all causes, including the two leading killers in Western society today, heart disease and cancer. So what is the magic formula? Modern science has clearly established that there is a lifestyle that promotes health and dramatically reduces the risk of disease. It includes a varied diet of fruits, whole grains, nuts and vegetables, and the avoidance of meat and high animal fat products. But equally important are adequate sleep exercising in the open air, drinking plenty of water, and abstaining from the use of tobacco, alcohol, coffee, tea, and other drugs. But how did such a comparatively small and relatively unknown group come to adopt such advanced principles over 120 years ago? After all, midway through the 19th century, no one even understood the cause of disease. Proof for the germ theory was yet in the future. There were no x-rays, aspirin, antibiotics, or antihistamines. Diphtheria, yellow fever, typhoid, cholera, and smallpox flourished. Tuberculosis, known as the White Plague, was the leading cause of death in the urban northeast of America and was accepted as a form of divine affliction. Malarial fever, called the ague, was considered a normal condition of westbound settlers. But even more bizarre than the diseases themselves were their supposed cures. To relieve their patients' sufferings, physicians prescribed calomel, or chloride of mercury, strychnine, arsenic, mercury, saltpeter, opium, alcohol, and tobacco. Many physicians denied their patients water both internally and externally while others performed amputation with anything but rust-free implements and without the benefits of anaesthetics. <coughs> Night air was considered dangerous. Windows and doors were kept closed for fear of catching cold. Blinds were drawn to avoid fading the furniture, while urban dwellers rarely exercised or bathed. The typically heavy diet of the day was made up predominantly of meat filled with grease, hot with condiments, and washed down with tea and coffee. Most people ate large quantities of food at any hour of day or night. The use of tobacco was widespread, 
even being defended by many physicians as a stimulant to the lungs, and its smoke a cure for bronchitis. Almost no one saw any relation between diet and prevailing sickness. Pioneer Adventist missionary J.N. Andrews expressed the near universal belief that the diseases people suffered were, and I quote, for the most part wholly beyond our control and ordered by God's hand. I say almost no one, for in the midst of this medical confusion, a few voices were calling for reform. Men like Sylvester Graham, who became the leader of the American health movement of the 1830s. He called for a return to nature and natural methods of healing and recommended a simple diet, including vegetarianism and especially whole wheat products. Food was to be prepared as free from spices and stimulants as possible. He also condemned tobacco, tea and coffee, alcoholic beverages, and the drugs commonly used in the medicines of the day. Though his reform crusade floundered within 10 years, others soon took it up with renewed enthusiasm. Hydrotherapy, that is healing with water, ice and steam, became popular in America under the leadership of doctors such as James Jackson and Russell Traw. Both headed water cure institutions and promoted health reform and both had close relationships with the pioneers of the fledgling Adventist church. Here in the state of New York in 1858, Dr. James C. Jackson established his home on the hillside above the town of Dansville. It was the most successful of all the water cure institutions. Jackson published a monthly periodical, Laws of Life, outlining his views. Strongly opposed to the drugs prescribed by his fellow physicians, he treated his patients with natural methods and remedies. He especially emphasized the idea of obedience to natural law and taught that to obey nature is to live. He believed that mistreatment of the body also affected man's moral capacities and therefore weakened the character. During the 1840s and 50s then, there were movements for reforms in health. Yet at the same time, there was also appalling general ignorance and carelessness regarding health and hygiene among most of the population in America. It was at such a time that God chose to alert the Sabbath-keeping Adventists of his concerns for everyone's health and happiness. As in Bible times, he used the prophetic gift. During the years 1844 to 1848, Ellen White received many visions, yet none dealt with principles of health. But in the autumn of 1848, she was shown not only that tobacco was injurious to the health, but that tea and coffee were also harmful. Long before science established the link between tobacco and fatal disease, and pointed out the dangers of excessive coffee consumption, Many members of the church began to alter their lifestyles in response to her appeals. During the years following 1848, the pages of the church's paper enthusiastically reported about battles to give up tobacco, tea and coffee. In the late winter of 1854, Ellen White reported another vision that spoke against the rich and greasy foods so common at that time. She also urged people to take special care of their God-given health by observing strict cleanliness of person and surroundings. The town of Otsego is situated about half an hour's drive by car west of Battle Creek. Early in June 1863, James and Ellen White and a number of friends travelled to Otsego and came to this home, which belonged then to Aaron Hilliard. During the Friday evening family worship, Ellen White began to pray for her husband, who was then in poor health, 
and depressed about conditions in the church at Battle Creek. While praying, she was given a vision which was to make a most significant impact upon the Seventh-day Adventist church and its message to the world. In her vision, Ellen White witnessed the role flesh foods have played in the decline of the human race from the time of Adam. Pig's flesh was denounced in particular, but all other kinds of meat were also blamed. The vision also spoke against the use of alcoholic drinks, spices, and rich desserts. Tobacco was described, and I quote, a poison of the most deceitful and malignant kind. Remember, this was 100 years before the famous United States Surgeon General's report, Smoking and Health. Tea and coffee, she said, had effects similar to those of tobacco, but to a lesser degree. Eating too much even of good food and snacking between meals or just before bed were shown to be distinctly unhealthful. In the treatment of disease, she saw the terrible effects of the drugs of the day, arsenic, strychnine, calomel and others. She said that poisonous drugs could also cause birth defects a fact tragically confirmed by later scientific studies. The elimination of these unwise foods and practices would have helped anyone to live better. However, the vision not only corrected errors, but gave counsel on the positive side as well. She stressed the importance of drinking lots of water exercising regularly out of doors, bringing sunshine and fresh air into the home, and bathing daily. Today, this is all pretty much common sense, but it was a strange message to many in the 1860s. A review of denominational literature shows that in the six years prior to the vision, half of those whose deaths were recorded in church papers were under the age of 30. Clearly, lifestyle changes were needed, even within the church. As far as Ellen White herself was concerned, she later wrote, I was astonished at the things shown me in vision. Many things came directly across my own ideas. Nevertheless, she was clear about the implications of the health message. Health reform is one branch of the great work which is to fit a people for the coming of the Lord. There are, of course, biblical statements which support such an understanding of the importance of physical and mental health. Jesus himself devoted more time to healing the sick than he did to preaching during his time on earth. The Apostle Paul explained to the church members in Corinth about the body being the temple of the Holy Spirit. He also taught the church in Thessalonica that a belief in the soon coming of Jesus called for the body as well as the spirit and soul to be preserved blameless unto the coming of Christ. It's not difficult to see that Ellen White's concepts merely serve to magnify the biblical view that each person is accountable to God for the preservation of health. But how much did she rely on her contemporaries for her information? Ellen White declared that she did not read any literature on health or know of Dr. Jackson's magazine, The Laws of Life, before the vision. Because of her busy schedule, she did not publish the first account of the vision until 1864. It was not until after this that she turned to some of the current books and journals on health, and as she said, I was surprised to find them so nearly in harmony with what the Lord had revealed to me. She carefully selected extracts from these journals that were consistent with what she'd been shown in vision and included them in her publications on health in 1865. During the years following 1863, more visions were given to Ellen White on the subject of health. It is obvious that they prevented her from promoting the ideas zealously advocated by some writers since proved to be false. 
Dr. Troll, for example, totally banned salt and sugar on the grounds that salt was a mineral poison and sugar was no food at all. Ellen White used a little of both, but warned of their bad effects if used too freely. Concerning salt, she wrote in 1901, From the light given me by God, salt is actually essential for the blood. The whys and wherefores of this I do not know, but I give you the instruction as it is given me. Long before the effects of cholesterol were known, she wrote that olive oil was far preferable to animal oil or fat. She promoted a vegetarian diet, supplemented by a limited use of milk and eggs, long before science confirmed their health benefits. In fact, a vegetarian diet has been found to significantly improve the endurance of athletes. Her concern over refined foods and the use of too much sugar has been amply confirmed by scientific research. And what are the benefits of walking and other exercise in the open air, of water, sunshine, adequate recreation and rest that she so strongly advocated? Who would deny them today? But in Ellen White's day, her messages were not without opposition. Contrary to the medical opinion of her time, she advanced the importance of the function of the mind in the healing process. Today, the science of psychosomatics recognizes the vital role the mind plays in conquering disease. So you really don't want to perhaps face work or wherever it happens to be. In June 1982, a joint report was issued by the American Academy of Sciences and the National Research Council entitled Diet, Nutrition and Cancer. It concluded that by making certain changes of diet, a person may substantially reduce the risk of contracting cancer. Reforms suggested include eating largely of fruits, grains and vegetables and reducing the consumption of fats, salt, sugar and alcohol. Apart from Ellen White's call for total abstinence from alcoholic beverages, this report does not depart in any significant detail from what she herself wrote more than a century before. But what of her own health? The vision of June 1863 came to Ellen when she was weak, feeble, and subject to frequent fainting spells and dizziness. She suffered throughout her life from heart disease and had been paralyzed five times before 1870. She described herself as a great meat eater and that bread was especially distasteful to her. But she accepted the instruction given her and after 1863 radically changed her lifestyle and diet. As a result, her former faintness and dizziness left her permanently and her health began to improve. A year or two before Ellen White died at the age of 87, Arthur Spaulding, the storyteller and historian, visited her at Elmshaven. After family worship here in the parlour, she moved outside to the hall and with her brisk light step approached the stairway. Arthur Spaulding offered to assist her up the stairs, but she replied, Oh no, thank you. I am very able to climb the stairs by myself. Why, I am as spry as when I was a girl. As when I was a girl, I should say not. When I was a girl, I was ill and weak and in wretched health. But now the Lord has made me well and strong, and I am better, much better than when I was a girl. Toward the end of his career, Dr. Clive McKay, professor of nutrition at Cornell University, New York, 
was introduced to Ellen White's writings on food and nutrition. He was deeply impressed and was particularly intrigued by the question of the sources of her information. He asked how a woman with virtually no education could set out health teachings so far in advance of her time. He rejected the idea that she copied from her contemporaries. After all, how did she know which ideas to borrow and which to reject among the bewildering array of 19th century theories and health teachings, most of which were quite irrational and have since been discarded? He believed that she would have had to be a most amazing woman with knowledge beyond her times to do this successfully. After extensively reading her writings on health, Dr. McKay began to lecture various professional societies on Ellen White's concepts. I am impressed with the correctness of her teachings in the light of modern nutritional science, in spite of the fact that her works were written long before the advent of modern scientific nutrition. No better overall guide is available today. By 1865, the Adventist church had reached a membership of some 4,000. Though it possessed little wealth, it had been reminded in the vision of 1863 that it had a sacred duty to alert others with regard to their health. But how was the church to accomplish this goal? In August 1865, James White succumbed to the burdens and pressures of church leadership and suffered a breakdown in health. His wife brought him here to Dr. Jackson's home on the hillside in Dansville, where he was treated for about three months. The Whites had an opportunity to observe the principles of health reform in practice and found much to commend. Yet they regarded some of the principles of healing contrary to the teachings of Jesus. In fact, they received some medical advice that may well have proved fatal in James White's case. In December, Ellen decided to remove her husband from the Dansville Institution, and they journeyed to Rochester in western New York State. Much prayer was offered there on James White's behalf, and on Christmas Day, 1865, God responded by giving them a remarkable Christmas present. Ellen White was given a vision in which she saw that the church should begin its own health care institution for those who wish to learn how to take care of themselves and thus prevent sickness. In the following year, a remodeled old house was purchased in the west end of Battle Creek, Michigan then a flourishing manufacturing town with a population of 5,000. Known as the Western Health Reform Institute, it opened its doors in September 1866 as the first Seventh-day Adventist medical facility in the world. Circulars advertising the institution declared that no drugs whatever would be administered. Natural methods of healing such as water, air, light, heat, food, sleep, rest, recreation, etc., would be employed. By food, they meant a strictly healthful diet consisting of fruits, grains, and vegetables. In 1875, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, a recent graduate from America's prestigious Bellevue Hospital Medical College in New York, joined the staff of the Institute. He had been encouraged and financially supported in his medical training by the Whites. In the following year, at the age of 24, he was appointed medical superintendent of the Institute, a position he retained for the next 67 years. In 1877, the Institute became the Battle Creek Medical and Surgical Sanitarium. It was the same year that Louis Pasteur presented his germ theory to the French Academy of Sciences. The face of medicine was about to experience change, and Dr. Kellogg, would play a major role. As the reputation of the sanitarium spread, its buildings were considerably enlarged, and by 1885, it was the largest institution of its kind in the world. 
During the late 1890s, its staff numbered nearly 1,000. Kellogg became widely known as administrator, physician, surgeon, author, lecturer, inventor, and food manufacturer. He kept abreast of all the latest developments in medical knowledge by extensive reading and traveling to Europe to study under the leading physicians there. He was the author of nearly 50 books with a circulation of over a million copies. Some were the first authoritative scientific works ever published in America in their respective fields. He founded a medical college and during his lifetime performed more than 22,000 operations, the last when he was 88 years old. His surgical operations were so neat that the Kellogg scar became a trademark. He conducted over 5,000 public lectures to hundreds of thousands of Americans. Dressed in white, he spoke regularly in the sanitarium on the latest medical progress and the system of healthful living he spent his life promoting. He invented many types of apparatus for the treatment of the sick, including this mechanical horse. President Coolidge used one for daily exercise at the White House. Some of his inventions are still in use around the world today. Get up, boy. <laughs> Kellogg also developed scores of health foods, including cornflakes, which changed the breakfast habits of millions. After the disastrous fire which destroyed the sanitarium in 1902, Kellogg determined to rebuild bigger and better, although this was contrary to the advice of Ellen White and other church leaders. His new sanitarium still stands in Battle Creek today, but is now owned by the United States government. Its impressive portico and entrance welcomed many who came to Kellogg for treatment and to learn of his ways to health. Though he later left the church, he continued to uphold its health principles. Famous visitors during the more than 60 years of his superintendency included industrialist and financier John D. Rockefeller, Jr., author George Bernard Shaw, inventor Thomas Edison, Soviet writer Leo Tolstoy, explorer to the polar region Raoul Amundsen, the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic, Amelia Earhart and President William Howard Taft, who registered as patient number 100,000. In 1891, Kellogg was asked how the Battle Creek Sanitarium was able to keep five years ahead of the rest of the medical profession. Kellogg replied that if something new was advocated, he instantly adopted it if it agreed with the philosophy and principles of health promoted by Ellen White. By 1901, it was reported that 27 Adventist sanitariums and 31 treatment rooms were then functioning, not only in the United States, but also in Switzerland, Denmark, England, Germany, South Africa, India, Mexico, Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific Islands. Ellen White lived in Australia from 1891 to 1900. During her stay, she encouraged the establishment of treatment rooms that were operated initially in the city suburb of Ashfield by two nurses who had trained at Battle Creek. Later, the location changed to Summer Hill, where it became a medical and surgical sanitarium. In July 1899, Ellen White called for the building of a sanitarium away from the center of Sydney that would uphold spiritual values and sound principles of physical and mental healing. Later that year, she was among the group who traveled from Thornley Station, a northern suburb, by way of the bush track around Dog's Head Rock to inspect a 75-acre property that was the highest land in the Sydney area. During the next few years, a 100-bed sanitarium was built. It was officially opened on January the 1st, 1903. Replaced in 1973 by this modern 304-bed facility, 
The Sydney Adventist Hospital is committed to the principles of clinical excellence, united with a Christian healing ministry. Writing from her home in California in 1905, Ellen White urged establishing more sanitariums in Australia, particularly near Melbourne. In Warburton, about an hour's drive east of Melbourne, a small sanitarium was opened in 1910. It too has developed into a well-operated Christian institution that provides acute care as well as a strong health care program emphasizing prevention and rehabilitation. It was in Southern California, however, that Ellen White was to most noticeably influence the church's developing Christian healing ministry. She lived here in her home, Elmshaven, in Northern California, for the last 15 years of her life. During that time, she was given many night visions concerning the work of the church. In one such vision in 1902, God revealed to her that in Southern California, there were unoccupied properties in the country suitable for sanitarium purposes and for sale at a price far below the original cost. Not long after this, a three-story building on beautifully landscaped grounds in Paradise Valley near San Diego became available for sale. It had been used as a sanitarium and originally cost $25,000, but was now being offered for $12,000 because of lack of water. Negotiations followed for some 18 months until in 1904, the price was lowered to $4,000, far below the original cost, just as Ellen White had predicted. After the property had been purchased, she secured the services of an Adventist well driller, Salem Hamilton. Mr. Hamilton. Ma'am, we've reached 98 feet. Do you realize that it's 10 stories down? Mm -hmm. And we found nothing but dry dirt and sand. Are you sure the Lord wants you to buy this place? I certainly am, Mr. Hamilton. Three times I was shown in vision that we should secure this property. Well, that's good enough for me, I guess. The Lord wouldn't give us an elephant without providing water for it to drink. Would he, ma'am? Salem Hamilton returned to his drilling and within an hour heard the sound of an underground river. Soon water began to seep through and that night rose 18 feet or nearly six meters in the well. The sanitarium's water supply was assured. Still owned and operated by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Paradise Valley Hospital continues to offer its ministry of healing to the surrounding community. In April 1904, Ellen White urged that a sanitarium should be secured and operated near Los Angeles in some rural district. In Glendale, a suburb of Los Angeles, a three-story building on five acres of land, representing an initial investment of $50,000, was offered to the church for $26,000. In 1904, it was purchased for $12,000, far below the original cost. After its purchase, Ellen White challenged its managers with the words, Spiritual as well as physical healing is to be brought to those who come for healing. Words that still motivate the operation of the hospital today. But there was to be a third sanitarium in Southern California. As early as October 1901, Ellen White had seen in vision that near Los Angeles, there was an occupied building and fruit trees on the sanitarium grounds. This vision was so real to her that she seemed to be walking about the grounds, talking with the patients and living there herself. Neither Paradise Valley nor Glendale fully met this description. In 1904, 76 acres of property for sale were discovered near Redlands. It was called Loma Linda, the Hill Beautiful, 
and included large gardens and orchards, beautifully landscaped lawns, scores of shade trees, carriage drives and cement walks. Among the buildings on the summit of Hill Beautiful was a four-storey, 64-room hotel lighted with electricity, heated with steam and with an abundance of fresh water. It originally cost $150,000. The final purchase price was $38,900, far below the original cost. On June the 12th, 1905, Ellen White came to Loma Linda for the first time. As she was shown through the buildings and over the grounds, she repeatedly said that she recognized this as the very place she had seen in vision four years before. The securing of this sanitarium, thoroughly equipped and furnished, is one of the most wonderful providences that the Lord has opened before us. Loma Linda will become an important educational center. A school is to be established here for the training of gospel medical evangelists. It is to be of the highest order. Those who founded it had little money, but they possessed a fortune in faith, faith in God and in his power to bring health and hope to the suffering. Today, as Loma Linda University, it operates as one of the largest schools of medicine in the Western United States and is at the forefront of medical knowledge and research. This proton accelerator, developed for the treatment of cancer, is the first of its kind in the world. Along with the hundreds of other Seventh-day Adventist healthcare institutions around the world, the goal of Loma Linda Medical Center is not just to make men and women well physically, but through a ministry of Christ-like compassion and selfless service, to bring them into spiritual healing and into union with God and prepared for the soon coming of Christ. Such a goal reflects the overruling purpose of the Seventh-day Adventist healthcare program as revealed to the church through the prophetic gift bestowed upon Ellen White. That purpose involves much more than adopting a vegetarian diet or choosing not to smoke or drink alcohol. It is concerned not only with the cure of disease, but also its prevention. Its example and motivation come from the infinite love of Jesus, the divine Good Samaritan, who came to a world of sickness, pain and death to bring healing, physical, mental, and spiritual. Today, he bids us to follow in his steps.